So WordPress is a part of many modern businesses as either a platform for their web presence and marketing or their development platform or even a sales channel. As amazing as WordPress is, you need more than just WordPress to run a website, uh, to run a business uh, or grow it as a successful business. Uh, many startups fail, and not every great idea is destined to be transformed into a profitable business. Our panel will discuss how they started, funded, managed, and built their businesses from a startup idea to a successful enterprise. I've got Mark Forrester from Woo Themes, Ryan Knutzer from App Themes slash Tiny Giant Studios. Uh, Mark Henderson from Kaluma Development and Ali Alan Jaffe from ROI Media. So I'm going to hand over to each of the panelists and they're going to do about a two to three minute uh, intro and they're going to address a few questions that I gave them. And they've, they've hopefully all prepped. <laughs> Here we go, over to Mark first. Thanks Ashley. My name is Mark Forrester. As Ashley said, I am one of the three co-founders of Woo Themes. Um, AD Pino, or AD Rockstar as he likes to be known, um, is here in Cape Town, but not here today. He's in Boston talking at a conference. And then there's Magnus Jepsen, who is in Stavanger, Norway. And the three of us met online whilst I was living in the UK. And that was four and a half, five years ago. Um, and all three of us were sort of freelancing within the WordPress space, which back then was just a blogging platform. And we were very crudely creating a WordPress templates. And um, we decided, well, we spotted a gap in the market. Um, yeah, back then it was only really Brian Gardner of Studio Press who was um, touching on that space. And everyone, all the themes that were available were freely available and all just purely around blogging. And um, we thought, let's create some templates with more of a magazine layout and feel, with lots of theme options where you can add your logo, change the color scheme, um, add advertising banners, add some uh, custom widgets. And um, yeah, we tested the market with um, a theme called Premium News Theme on a site called Premium News Theme, only ever thinking that we were going to create one theme. And um, yeah, that AD started that, that business. Um, and he invited Maggie and, and me to um, customize his template and uh, try and sell it as a new theme. And um, yeah, over the next few months, we saw some sales ticking over using eJunkie. And um, all of us realized that we were making money whilst we were sleeping, as opposed to our freelance work where we were charging by the hour and um, not really affording holidays and affording to be sick. So we saw um, this passive source of income as the way forward. And um, yeah, we Themes came about from that. And for the last few years, we've been really uh, progressing with WordPress templating and, and creating awesome themes. And um, this last year, since the last WordCamp, when we were also here at, at the Waterfront um, conference, um, is when things have really exploded in the plugin space. And um, WooCommerce is our flagship pl uh, plugin now. It's been downloaded 350,000 times in a year. Um, we've created 100 extensions and um, a whole bunch of templates for that. And our goal now is to become the ultimate w WordPress platform provider across themes, plugins, and hosting going forward. I think that's about two minutes, so I'll pass on. Wow, it's a bit of a tough act to follow. Um, my name's Rian. Uh, I spoke earlier from App Themes slash Tiny Giant Studios. Um, I make child themes, so I kind of take the success, success that these guys have and leverage it to my own advantage by building child themes. So I'm almost sponging off of you. Um, where did it start? I was a freelancer just like these guys. Uh, the only difference is I didn't study it. Everything I know was through YouTube videos, reading a few books, and spending loads and loads of time on lynda.com. Once I've mastered the, you know, the kind of the basics, the HTML and the CSS, all those kind of jargon, I thought, listen, I'm not bringing in as many clients as I'd hoped. I was stuck in a foreign country, um, England, sorry for all the English guys around here. And um, 
Oh yeah, as I said, I was stuck. I didn't bring in enough clients, which, mean, uh, which means I wasn't making enough money. I started out doing Tumblr themes, premium Tumblr themes, and that market has since exploded as well. It's, it's almost earmarked as, as the next WordPress market, although I don't think so. That's just me. I sold those themes on, on ThemeForest, um, and that experience of going through the whole theme forest reviewing process was very, very rigorous. Um, at that stage, I knew less than I do now um, about designing, because I had to design everything um, myself. I didn't have a team around me. I didn't have experts that I consult. And sad to say, I didn't have any uh, developer friends while in England. So that whole theme forest process really groomed me for the WordPress market. I don't develop Tumblr themes anymore. I prefer the WordPress market. They're bigger, in my, in my opinion. And what I've found is that they are far more willing to spend money because the industry has moved so far beyond normal blogging. It's, it's app-based themes, it's business sites, it's all of those kind of sites, and the marketplace, are, they're just more willing to spend money. Obviously, because I haven't got the skills or the team that these guys have, a lot of it is just me, myself, and I doing the coding. So what I had to do is design stuff, de design child themes, sell it on marketplaces around the world, app themes and theme forest and all that sort of stuff. Um, and hopefully, the users that these guys attract to their themes will filter through to me. Uh, that's my business model. That's who I am. I'll hand on over. Hi. I'm Mark Henderson. I'm the founder of a company called Kaluma. We used to be a traditional business software company and are relatively new to the world of WordPress. So we had an application which, while delivered in a web browser, looked something like salesforce.com. Not very customer friendly. It required training to get up and going. And we were involved in logistics and supply chain, uh, a very big industry, but not something that many people in this room, I imagine, have come across. More recently, a client came to us with an opportunity to do something that was more customer facing. And our expertise are not in aesthetics and design. And so we felt we had to partner with the design company that was able to provide a very consumer friendly offering. And we needed a technology platform to do that. And our code base is based on PHP. We've been around for a long time, way before the invention of uh, both Rails and Ruby, the language. And so we loved PHP. We were familiar with it. And based on the research, we looked at the usual suspects. Uh, you know, clearly WordPress, Drupal, Joomla, um, and a number of others, and were blown away by the momentum behind WordPress. We very quickly realized WordPress is a lot more than a blogging platform. WordPress today is a full-blown content management system that is available for free, unlike many of the other enterprise content management systems that are out there. And as believers in the open source um, environment, in in so far as we're able to sort of stand on the shoulders of giants, we felt that, that here was another open source technology building block that we could leverage to access our market. And so uh, with the help of a Cape Town design company called Tenacity, we were able to create a fantastic front-end experience for this uh, partner of ours, all in WordPress and through a WordPress plugin, stream our business application into the page in the same way that you would stream a banner ad or um, you know, an, an updating Twitter feed, we actually are streaming forms um, that provide the business functionality. So uh, in terms of the origin of the company, uh, Kaluma started in the early 2000s in Cape Town. I'd been part of a, a failed attempt at a dot-com 1.0 startup in San Francisco. We raised a bunch of venture capital. Uh, hired a big team, had some very fancy offices, and then the market crashed. And like everybody else, I was part of that exodus, came back to Cape Town, because this was the good life on the cheap, and was looking around for something to do. And as people without much to do end up doing, I started consulting. And the consulting led to a project where a customer had a requirement that looked very familiar. They're, they're patterns. If you think about all aspects of business, we see things repeating themselves over and over again. And so the approach was, how can we take 
these patterns in creating business software and make them easily reproducible. And so Kaluma's platform is one where you can define building blocks in a workflow, whether you want to create a Word document to a PDF, you want to put something in a calendar, get, an, get something authorized, get something signed electronically. It's a case of assembling these building blocks, these Lego blocks in different configurations um, each time. And we are now doing that with a lovely WordPress front end. Hi, uh, my name is Alan Jaffe. I'm the managing director of ROI Media. For my Afrikaans friends, it's not Roy Media, it's Return on Investment. I started the company in 2003. Uh, we're based in Cape Town. We're a team of 42. In terms of what we do, we specialize in generating online sales, revenue leads for businesses through online channels. Um, if that's sounding a little bit vague, how we do it, number one, we develop an online business uh, through a website. We love WordPress. Uh, number two, we drive traffic, and obviously there are different permutations, but SEO, pay-per-click, paid search, uh, and once they arrive on the website, we make sure they buy. And the art of making sure they buy is something called conversion rate optimization. Through heat mapping, uh, we ensure that the goals are achieved. In terms of how I actually started, uh, I was in Miami setting up webhosting.net. I co-founded that. Now, when I arrived in 2001 for the second stint, when I'd sold everything I own and packed my bags and gone, a couple things happened. Number one, as you mentioned, it was the dot bomb. So timing is everything, and for me, it was terrible. Number two, two weeks later, September 11th happened, uh, which was even worse. And number three, owning a domain like webhosting.net, I was told there was huge amounts of type-in traffic. To When I installed analytics, I noticed there was actually nothing. So now it was a case of adapt or die, and uh, I decided I didn't want to die, and I started investigating something called search engine optimization back in the early days of Google. My first quote that I actually got was probably one of the most credible companies, uh, $57,000. I obviously couldn't afford this, and that's when it was in the trenches, starting to figure out how to do this, which I did. Uh, got number two in the world for the word web hosting, and thought, hey, this is actually quite cool. Maybe I can make other businesses revenue like I've done for web hosting. Made an exit, came back to Cape Town, uh, and went into the bandwidth barn, which I'm sure a lot of you have been through. But uh, mine was a little more humble. I rented a desk uh, for 500 Rand a month uh, and literally got my first client, worked it. And uh, the first client was also um, a crazy client to have taken on. It was gambling.com. Uh, which we got number one in the world for gambling, online gambling, uh, and thousands of other keywords. And that sort of paved the way to setting up ROI Media. Um, and right now we have eight different divisions offering obviously a multitude of services all around ROI. Thanks a lot, guys. Uh, really, uh, so uh, set the tone. Uh, so now I've got some questions. And it's one versus the other. And I've chosen each one of the people to speak today or in the panel because they have very different experiences in their own business environment. So my first question is, what is your opinion of venture capital funding? Would you accept the funding or do you think it's better to bootstrap your business? I think most people that know WooThemes know that we're big believers in bootstrapping. and. I think it depends largely on the industry you're in. If you're selling a digital product, it's much easier. There's, there's much lower cost of sales. Um, it's basically your time in producing um, the goods. And you know, our background in theming, theming requires a lot of time and quite a bit of skill, but not much venture capital to um, get started. And we were very fortunate to be profitable from day one. I think we were blessed that Five years ago, WordPress, the commercial area of WordPress was pretty much untapped, and it was a new product in a new market. And um, yeah, compared to, to people starting out in WordPress these days, it's a lot more difficult. Um, and yeah, depending what you're launching, maybe you'll need to take on some money or expert help in the form of VC. Um, I've also been involved in a, in a business prior to WooThemes where we did take on some venture capital. 
and all I can say is it comes with a lot of red tape and um, try and find a revenue model for your business um, before taking on VC. We had a, a big database of valuable information with that business, um, but no idea of how we were going to make money off it. And hence we took on VC and um, yeah, little to say that that business isn't around anymore. I never had the opportunity to, uh, to have any venture capital in my business. So just from experience, bootstrapping, I had to do it. There, there was no other alternative. A flip side to what Mark just said, having been a, a futures trader on, on, on the stock exchange, I've got a bit of a different view to venture capital firms. I think there's a lot of them in there that they spot an idea, they see you're immature, they go in and they want a tremendous amount of market share um, of share options in, in your business. For me personally, I would still go the bootstrap route, but I do know there's some venture capital firms that actually do more than just provide the cash. If you've got the ability or, or yeah, if you've got the, the right partner, should I say, um, or venture capital firm to invest with you, you should be looking at what are they bringing to the party outside of cash. Are they bringing in accounting expertise that, quite frankly, you as a freelancer or even as a small firm will pay quite a bit of money to, to sort out? Do they have business administration? Do they have business and analysis skills? If they can bring that into your business, it is definitely worth considering. That's my point. I'd like to see a show of hands from people in the audience who work for companies with venture capital in Cape Town. I'm guessing it's very, very few people. Now, I think this brings us back to where we are with WordPress as a platform, which is the barriers to entry are very, very low. These days, companies need very few resources. They just need a little bit of uh, hard work and effort and sometimes some luck to succeed as opposed to millions of dollars or tens of millions of rand. If we were having this conference 10 years ago, the guys on stage would have been talking about Sun Microsystems servers and not Ubuntu or Debian. They would have been talking about Oracle databases and not MySQL. And most of the content management systems that you know, we know of today didn't exist 10 years ago. So you, know, you would have needed teams of tens or hundreds of programmers to write the building blocks that you needed before you could create the business. We don't need that today. I mean, today we need, you know, in San Francisco, there's a, there's a new incubator, which I, I think is something that's an interesting concept called Y Combinator, where they give guys $15,000 in three months to build an entire business, which is absolutely nothing, which is the sort of thing that, you know, we could do in evenings and weekends over a period of six to nine months and achieve the same sort of results. Um, not necessarily the same results in terms of the big acquisitions you get as being part of the Silicon Valley ecosystem, and that's another reason why, you know, we we do things differently here. You know, in Silicon Valley, you don't raise venture capital to spend it; you raise venture capital to put you on the map over there to allow you to out hire somebody else. If if you are competing with Google or Facebook for an engineer, um, they're going to say, "Well, how much money do you have?" If you say, "Well, I have a profitable idea." It's, it's not very interesting, but if you say, oh, we've just raised $15 million from the same funders as Facebook and we're going to be the next Facebook, you're going to get their interest. Uh, that's not our market in Cape Town. I think our market is very much one of, let's create a, an interesting idea that gets some traction, and then if you want to scale it, there certainly are options. And I mean, in South Africa, it seems to be large companies that will come in and buy portions of your business. You know, uh, if you look at the trajectory of companies like Mixit, uh, you know, before there was a final acquisition, they did have injections of cash along the way. But the key thing is that they'd nailed the idea. They'd got the recipe right before they raised money. And I think that's something to keep in mind. So most of us will never need venture capital. Let's focus on nailing the concept, and then we can look at how to scale it. And in many cases, bootstrapping is still the best method. Uh, I definitely agree of uh, bootstrapping. It's what I did. However, you know, what you spoke about uh, in terms of developing a product or a concept, uh, I'm sure you've read uh, The Lean Startup 
So the Lean Startup, for any of you wanting to start a business, you should read it. There's a term in there called MVP, which is Minimum Viable Product. And it talks about developing an idea or concept as cheaply as possible. And if you're thinking, is it crazy to say $15,000 to actually get a concept off the ground, it's actually a lot of money. So before you're actually getting funding or you're actually going to self-fund, the key is to work on a concept that actually works, that you can run experiments for next to nothing and actually figure out if this is a viable business or sort of concept to go forward with. Um, I think after then, if it does work, you actually don't need that much uh, investment because a lot of the times investments thrown at something that doesn't work. And I don't know what the statistic is on VC funded uh, ideas going belly up, but it is quite high. Uh, it's probably quite a high ratio. So definitely um, turning that all, all the way around, uh, a lot of you have jobs. Uh, and if you want to start your own business, there's a huge risk factor. So how do you do that? Do you stop working? Uh, you now have a little bit of savings, and now how are you going to set up a business? The odds are stacked against you, and in that situation, it's something my brother always said is, you know, do you want to have a big piece uh, of a little pie or vice versa? And I, I think that's the key. If you want 100% control, it can limit the way your business grows, and it can, you can be uh, having 100% of something very small. So that's a consideration when growing a business. Cool. Thank you very much. Okay, so when managing your business, a uh, key aspect is having the right team. Um, now, you guys have been speaking about uh, distributed and uh, distributed teams. Um, well, maybe not speaking. I, I think earlier we were chatting about it. Um, Mark, you're based in New York, uh, but your team is in South Africa. Um, Alan, your team is all based in one office, if I'm correct. Yeah. And uh, Rian, you, you work with a bunch of guys in the States. Uh, are they all in the States? Two guys in the States. Okay. And uh, well, Mark, you guys work all over the world. Um, so my question is, how do you choose between a distributed team or a fixed location? And what kind of challenges do you have if you do choose a distributed uh, team? Why I say challenge is there because you're not all in the same office. You can't just say, can we have a meeting and sit down together? Well, maybe Mark can start first. Uh, time zones can be very tricky and uh, I'm actually in the throes of relocating to a more convenient time zone, which is London. Um, it's, I started in San Francisco and you would be having either midnight meetings or 7 a.m. meetings, neither of which are good for your social life. And so New York made a lot, life a lot easier uh, given the six hour time difference. Um, but South Africa is, is perfectly placed in terms of the, Euro the European market. Uh, you know, it's, it's either an hour or two hours difference with the UK, depending on daylight savings. And it's, it's really just about being able to be on the same page as your team. And I, I think, you know, the various guys here are going to talk about different tools and techniques that they use. And, you know, we're a relatively small team. So, you know, while we are distributed in the sense that, uh, you know, sales and marketing is, is based overseas, we do have all of our developers in a room. And um, for, for what we do, uh, you know, we have a relatively large code base and it takes a while to get new engineers up to speed with our, with our technology. And so mentoring and being able to turn around and speak to somebody uh, it does help in our case. Um, but we can, uh, we'll probably get onto tools and techniques in a moment. For me, um, the reason that I've grown such a large team in one location is collaboration, I think which some might argue it could be achieved through web-based platforms, um, but probably just the fact that people are so close that we can collaborate, that we can bounce ideas, and we can grow. And I, I think in terms of some of the services like SEO that we offer, there's a lot of secret sauce. So um, there is a trust issue. So setting up different offices for me uh, it's on the cards. We're looking at opening up in Joburg now, but there's a control element which I get sometimes worried about. And I'd like to hear how you guys work around that. Yeah, our team, we, we have eight here in Cape Town in the Tiger Valley waterfront, and then we've got the rest of the team um, all over the world and, like I said, seven countries. And um, in the past, we've always hired the cream of the crop. I mean, we're a digital company, so we can hire wherever they are in whatever time zone. It doesn't matter. Um, 
now we're realizing that hiring in seven different countries has um, impacts on tax and um, yeah, different uh, employee, employee laws um, in those countries. Um, we've had to set up structures in specific countries um, to accommodate the staff in those areas and going forward we're only hiring in particular places now. Um, so think of that, we didn't think of that as much. Um, with regards to our local team here, I think having guys all in one office really, the, our head office acts as a think tank um, where everyone can play off ideas and, and talk with each other one-on-one -on -one whenever they want. And I think the rest of the team plays off that energy a lot. So having our local team is something that's hugely val valuable and I think we always look to hire here first if we can. Um, then when we have meetings, we do organize regular meetings uh, amongst the team. It's done over Skype. Um, we try and have text chats open at all times between staff members. Um, guys are in all different time zones, so we want guys to feel like they're not alone if they're sitting in China and everyone else is asleep. So, um, yeah, we seem to have like three or four guys online at any point in time. and. We set quite strict deadlines on projects, so what hours they work is completely up to them. We have a lot of night owls who work crazy hours and obviously don't have children. Um, but yeah, managing a distributed team um, has worked well for us, but like I said, we're a digital agency and, and quite borderless and proud of that. I'll speak in my capacity as someone that's on the App Themes team and um, how I've experienced it as being one of these team members. I'm the only one in Africa, as far as I know, for App Themes. We've got guys in Romania, Czechoslovakia, um, South America, I think it's Brazil. We've got another guy in Portugal, and then the main head office is in San Francisco as well. What we've been doing, as with Mark, Skype is, is the main theme of communication or main method of communication. Um, I am open all the time, pretty much. Uh, bug ticketing and all of that is mostly done um, through third-party applications like Lighthouse and GitHub and, and all that sort of stuff. And that's where the core of our communication almost comes from when we start building uh, products. Our support team, again, also just as diverse. There's one in New Zealand, there's another guy in South America, there's a Filipino guy. And what it's helped us to do, um, especially for app themes, when support requests come in, what you'll find some of the time is that the, the guy logging the ticket doesn't really speak English all that well. And so usually you'd be able to pick up where that guy is from, and you'd be able to address his support query in his native language, which just helps um, in terms of getting that ticket cleared faster and obviously quicker. For me, um, I'm kind of one of the only f few front-end guys, so I don't need to be in development meetings all the time, so I can't really talk about time zones. I know when I um, talk with, with Shannon, which is our chief um, operator, ops officer, um, it's kind of, there is a time difference, so my meetings is usually at six at night, um, which isn't convenient if you've got a family, um, and pretty much what the rest of the guys echoed is having a distributed workforce is great, but it does, your meetings does suffer. The big reason why we've got such a distributed workforce is WordPress as a company, they've got core contributors, and those core contributors are situated pretty much all around the globe. So what App Themes did um, a while back, they kind of went on a hunt for those core developers, thinking that if they are in the process of developing WordPress, they'd be really good almost to poach in as a company. And that's why um, it's such distributed, such a distributed workforce with such a wide range of language skills, you know, just Filipino, Spanish, um, Portuguese, Romanian, Afrikaans. Um, yeah, that's it. Okay, um, so my next question is uh, about forming partnerships uh, or outsourcing business functions or keeping it all in-house. What do you do? How do you handle that? 
So I started on Elance. Um, that was way, 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 way back. And I quickly realized just because I watched a few Linda videos, I am definitely not an expert. So that's the one problem I had. The other problem is one of the sponsors of this conference, Elance. That is a place where I started to, to find jobs. Not only jobs to do, but also guys to almost hire. Um, I'm not going to go into the, the business model of Elance, but that's what I did because I quickly realized that as a sole trader at that stage, I point blank, I didn't have the skills that I thought I did. Now, having relocated to, um, to South Africa, speaking in my capacity from Tiny Giant Studios, um, I've met up and, and I've partnered with a fantastic PHP developer that just brings a whole different ball game to my offering. Hopefully that will transcend into more plugins for the app themes marketplace. And um, just from a, a, f a client perspective where we build themes for one of clients, the value in expertise that he brings to the table is immense. So for one man band, small, small guys, I would definitely recommend partnering up with guys that extend your skill level. Like one of the sayings uh, that I always remember is do what you do best. Um, and too many people out there claim to be the best at everything when they're actually not. Um, definitely in a digital environment, people go out there and they say, we do it all. And I call it the tick the box strategy where they just claim to do everything, but they're actually not good. And this is a short lived strategy. Uh, the moral of the story is do what you do best, outsource what you're not good at, or build competence. And in the short term, don't overinvest and get strategic partners. Uh, a partnership, the right partnership, will make, potentially break a business. But it can, uh, I was chatting to um, one of the media, large digital global agency, has about 650 people globally. And he said, one partnership put them on the map. And I think that's the key, is if you can have a, the right partnership, get, get them, work well with them, uh, and, and they will complement what you're trying to do. I, I think another aspect that's worth considering is partnering with your clients, your customers. So, I mean, I, it's, people pay lip service to the idea that customers are more than just customers, they're partners as well. And I know one of the aspects Ashley wants to touch on is revenue models, and I think that Increasingly, when you can bring value to your customers and you can measure that, you can quantify it in terms of clicks, in terms of uh, actual hard rand spent, it's, it's possible to start looking at sharing that revenue in a way that's truly win-win. Um, so I think partnerships, certainly from a supplier perspective, are absolutely essential. Uh, yes, stick to what you're good at. I think focusing on improving your strengths is far better time spent than on trying to work on your weaknesses. You know, if you're a, if you're a content person, get a bookkeeper. Don't, don't spend hours a day trying to figure out pastel yourself. You know, or if you're a, um, if you're a front end person, fi find a server guy, find a PHP guy. And all of these skills are different, but they're all out there and they don't have to be in Cape Town, they can be anywhere. Yeah, I think what Mark's just said is spot on. Um, with Wii themes, we had a massive management system called Woo Member that was custom built um, by an outsourced developer who didn't understand our business completely. And uh, we realized that it wasn't working out with him, so we moved on to another outsourced developer. Same problem, bought it in-house, the project, and Warren, our one developer, was working on it for his first year whilst at Woo Themes. And we realized that this massive membership system that we created including affiliate management, user management, checkout facilities, um, project management, bug tracking, was just one colossal pile of poo, basically. And um, rather outsource all of that, um, use the business tools that are available out there. There's such a wealth of tools available at such cheap prices. And these guys are all specializing in their niches, like we're specializing in WordPress. And we use Zephyrl now for our affiliate system. We use user voice for our support ticketing. We use desk for our mail management. Um, I think accept help wherever you can. 
Uh, I'm mindful of time and the schedule, so I'm going to ask one last question. Uh, what are the greatest mistakes you've made along the way, and what would you do differently? I think we remember was one of them. Um, other than that, I'd say we got a bit greedy, and we thought WordPress users were the same as every other content management system. And we started creating templates for Tumblr and Magento and Drupal, and we were just porting our themes. And we were relying on uh, third parties, um, partnerships we'd made with other developers to fulfill um, the needs in that content management system under our brand. And our brand is our baby, and it took a bit of a knock when we weren't performing so well on those other content management systems. Um, so I'd say I'll stick to what you're good at again. I can echo what Mark said. Um, the biggest mistake, because it's my personality to, you know, how hard can it be? You know, I'll just do it. Um, I quickly realized that actually I'm only good at one or two things and definitely not the whole scope that is uh, WordPress design and development. Um, the biggest lesson I took up, up to date is outsource where you can, or not outsource, partner, whichever of those you prefer. Get the tools in, get the people in that specializes in that. Um, it's, it's something that I'm still struggling with because it's in my personality. I want to know how that works. Um, you need to explain it to me and, and I tend to micromanage quite a bit. Um, I, I want to know everything and letting that go is, is difficult for me as, as a small business owner and it's still something that I'm learning and I'm still making a, a, a lot of mistakes. I think the next step for us um, where I'm sure I'm going to make a lot of mistakes is where I'm going to start to manage a team and it's a different ball game because now it's not just Oh, what does the theme look like, or how does it function, or does the user like it? It is catering to the guys that actually come in and work for you and deliver stuff for you, and trusting them enough for them to get on with their job. Um, that's, I can assure you, next time I speak, if I do speak, um, it's, that's going to be the issue that I'm going to deal with. Uh, there's, a, there's a saying in Silicon Valley which is, fail fast. And uh, I think there's a, a huge amount of value in realizing very quickly that you're doing the wrong thing, that you're spending time, money, and the energy of your organization uh, going down a, a dead end, going down a path where you reach the top of the hill and you, you, know, you break through the clouds and you look over and you realize that you summited a hill, but Kilimanjaro was next to you. And had you, had you been on that track, you would, you know, you'd be a lot more successful. And the only way to do that is to figure out how to measure whether you are succeeding or whether you're failing. In other words, to use metrics. Uh, the book, The Lean Startup, was mentioned, and I'm also a huge fan of this. Uh, it's a book by Eric Ries, um, and, where, and he talks about how to maximize what you have to get to a point where you succeed sooner than later. It's been very interesting today to hear yeah, various people talk about how they were doing one thing and then they had a realization that the pet project or the side project actually was where the opportunity is, so they, they switched over. The, the buzzword today seems to be pivot. They pivoted to this bigger opportunity. And the key is, how can you figure out as quickly and as cheaply as possible whether you're doing the right thing? Um, and I'm going to hand you over to the metrics guy because this is exactly his area of expertise. OK. <laughs> so, so for me, like one thing that I think you all will be familiar with is your gut. Trust your gut. There's often this big gray elephant in the room and no one ever wants to acknowledge it that it's there. And applying that to, to different facets of a business or a project, you have to acknowledge in uh, a, another book, Good to Great, they talk about how a guy had cancer and he was prepared to cut his arm off because that's what he had to do. Um, in, in my scenario, staff is, is key. They're not staff. They're part of a family. They're a team. And um, through almost 10 years, there have been people um, that are no longer with us, but where I've ac acknowledged that they weren't the right people or person for the job. And it's sometimes very difficult to take the decision that 
you know, they must leave and get them out because that's not my sort of personality. So if I could have acted quicker with certain situations, um, maybe that was my mistake. I think I'm getting better at it in a better evaluation process of getting the right people on the bus, which is another saying. Um, and I think that's the key is just your team is critical. I think that's the most important thing uh, of a company. Uh, a product's important, but without the right team, you're nothing. Okay, thank you everyone.